So I'll ask the panelists, you know, I mean, the different questions, you know, putting solar, you know. So what is your idea how we want to uh, get successful, say, for example, another five years' time, we have to have a 10 gigawatt level of installations, you know, Ashish. Sir, um, what are few and far between as of now? Uh, to my understanding, there are only three uh, decent sized projects. Um, and uh, there is some amount of tender activity which is also uh, happening. And the understanding once these systems are up, now people are going and visiting these places and trying to understand uh, the feasibility, the costing, and the technical aspects of these. So, uh, going forward, I, I have also been interacting with a lot of corporates who have, um, uh, what should I say, large uh, water uh, reservoirs. Uh, so, there is considerable amount of interest both from government side as well as uh, from the corporate side. And in terms of technology, I think uh, in India now we understand solar to a far better extent than say a year or two years back when there were hardly any installations. So, uh, I see a very, very bright future for this because this also helps in preserving the water levels and uh, the evaporation of the water and those kind of advantages are also there uh, apart from utilizing free area. Okay, thank you. So, now next question to Mank, you know. So, Mank has given an overview of the string inverter versus, you know, central inverter, you know. In fact, we have a string inverter installations in a, a small scale, but it is giving a very good, you know, uh, power output, I mean, compared to the, I mean, power generation compared to the centralized, you know. But as you know, the inverter is a very, very smart device, you know. Uh, in the daytime, say, peak hour, say, 11 to 4, you know, if we want to combine a little bit on the storage side and try to store a, a power on the peak hour rather than going to the grid, you know. So what is your idea? How we want to... Uh, do the integration and uh, what we call a reactive power, you know, and that how you want to go these things, you know, if you can give some idea, you know, uh, this will be benefit for us, you know. So as uh, you mentioned two points uh, in terms of uh, one is the peak type management of power. So as long as in the utility scale, there's no, uh, the grid is ready to take up the power, there's no issue, but if grid requires reactive power compensation, so now, uh, as far as I can speak for Huawei, we have this reactive power conversation feature. Uh, we can uh, tune in from SCADA. We can just give the command and the inverter will follow it. So uh, even the other manufacturers are uh, coming up with this feature. And uh, uh, as far as the storage is concerned, uh, there's lithium ion batteries. And I've been hearing a lot of discussion on aluminum air batteries. So uh, lithium ion batteries are currently available and some of the companies are like uh, working in this direction and Huawei has also come up with a battery waste solution which is mainly catering right now to the rooftop market but not to the utility segment that is another aspect if the market you know demands we can definitely look into that uh, feature adding up to our inverter but as of now there's not been much of a demand because of the uh, no solution good solution available in terms of battery storage so yes uh, there are a lot of uh, technological discussion going on if the the like aluminum ion batteries aluminum air batteries if commercializes to the scale of uh, you know the pricing comes down and two to three years of the time so we will definitely see that the solar power plant uh, mixing up with the storage so that it can help the grid managing the peak power demand in the evening time and grid uh, like NTPC and other uh, uh, of power of takers will be very happy to receive the power and store it and then you can supply into the evening time. Uh, that is one another uh, point you uh, just asked before was the floating. Uh, I would like to add uh, something to that as well. That as Huawei we have done more than 200 megawatt floating power plants uh, across uh, the Singapore, Japan and China. And this is another area which India should look positively and Seki has recently commented that we are going to put our you know, invite the bid for around 5 to 6 gigawatt tenders for the floating power plants. And there are some more good technologies like bifacial integrated with these string inverters can give you a very high yield in those uh, kind of circumstances. So it's very easy to, and I see a very good future for floating projects for India. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next question to Amaresh, you know. Uh, he is a... Uh, uh, 
in the quality inspections in the different module manufacturing companies, you know, uh, in uh, India as well as in China, at least there are maybe more than 200, you know, different manufacturing companies, but he has his quality standard, you know. So how do you want to guide us, you know, a little bit on the quality side, you know, uh, so that we know that uh, the module we are purchasing is on the safe side, you know. So you give some of your inputs on that. You know? uh, to make sure model work in the field, fundamentally there are only four steps. Number one, you ensure the good quality bomb. I think uh, DuPont talked a lot about the PVF polyvinyl fluoride back sheet. This is one of the aspects. But you ensure a very good bomb which resists the uh, harsh weather in India for 25 years. This is the first step. Second step, when you say you ensure a good bomb, it is by design. The second step is you ensure that the manufacturer delivers that bomb. Having a good design and making the manufacturer deliver that design are two different things. So if you make sure the manufacturer adheres to what you have agreed with him, this is the second step. Third step is the transportation and uh, you know, uh, 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 while you do the installation, you do not do a mechanical damage to the module. Uh, sir, you talked about the electroluminescence, it's all about the mechanical damage. When you do the transportation, there's a very likely, there is a very high likelihood that these cells may have micro cracks which you cannot see with the naked eye. So the first step is design, second is ensuring the right, I mean the, the manufacturer delivering the bomb. Third is to make sure the mechanical integrity of the module remains uh, uh, for the life and fourth is to make sure while the module is being performed in the field you do the right you have a right O&M practices for example uh, after each year or probably after every two years you have the the uh, uh, IR cameras in place you have field EL so that you make sure whatever you have installed it is in good shape and you get a good amount of power for next 25 years so these are the four basic steps thank you thank, thank you very much so I will ask Pradeep now Pradeep Benan <coughs> Uh, well, we are very much focused uh, sometimes on the ground mounted systems, you know, but we do neglect sometimes on the rooftop side, you know. So with your experience, like with the, uh, now the technology is going, you know, from the 1000 volt to 1500 volt, you know, and uh, also, uh, I know, it looks to be most easy on the rooftop mounting, but there is a challenge and also there are uh, different, the uh, the mistakes that the, what Amrish is told, you know, during the installations, you know, uh, the operators or the labor, they put their, you know, the leg on the, the modules and then there is a create a lot of uh, micro cracks, you know, so, and sometimes uh, for the cleaning, what is the kind of the challenge, you know, so I'd like to understand from you, you know. Hello. Yeah, in the rooftop uh, systems, uh, what we normally uh, see is, you know, the challenge is there. Yeah, in the uh, rooftop systems, the rooftop systems, you know, unlike the ground mount systems, yes, the cleaning of the modules is a major challenge. At times, you know, we have seen installations where, you know, there's hardly any kind of space left on the roof itself, you know, and making it very dangerous proposition also to be, you know, uh, cleaning the modules and all that. And uh, this has left, led, you know, to a lot of uh, loss within even six months of installing the system. We see a rapid decline in the overall generation and yield that comes up. Uh, today there are, uh, you know, first thing that what we feel is the, you know, you know, the right design of the array layout on the roof. Every roof has a specific, you know, nuances to it. And uh, this needs to be considered while designing itself so that there is appropriate you know, kind of maneuverability and, you know, safety aspects are taken into consideration when we uh, uh, do the uh, installation. Care has to be taken, like uh, one of the speakers in the earlier in the morning mentioned about the workmanship. That is a major area of concern. We see a lot of, uh, you know, unnecessary maintenance uh, need to be carried out because of, you know, loose connections that happen in the joints and in the connectors. 
So yes, the quality of the workmanship using the right uh, you know balance of systems. We have seen at times you know uh, short changing on the cables, you know solar cables not being used, but you know standard cables being used. Now these are all short term measures because maybe after five or eight years, you know you would need to maybe at times replace the whole uh, cables and other things. So yes, if a proper uh, right from you know ensuring that we have a proper design to you know uh, ensuring a good uh, protocol while doing the installation i think a lot of uh, you know trouble can be avoided and a good you know generation maintained over the service life of the system thank you thank you thank you very much now next questions i will ask pravin you know so pravin is from the g and he is handling the different material you know so uh, from the installations point of view from 2010 onwards we are only on the eighth year you know so we are in the mature level but uh, still uh, we are not sure that that the module will last for 25 years or no you know but there is a good news that uh, in the us you know there is a florida research center you know where they have installed but those days is the monocrystalline module even uh, when I learned photovoltaic, you know, I mean, 25 years back in Italy, there are a lot of installations. Still, it is 30 years and still it is generating power. But the conditions over there and in India is a bit different, you know. Uh, India is uh, because of the high temperature as well as humid conditions, you know. Initially, we didn't know what is PID effect, potential degradations, you know. But in Italy, you know, normally it is... Uh, you know, down to the Alps, you know, the temperature is uh, relatively low, you know, but still performing over there, you know. But when we purchase a module, you know, we sign an agreement with the module manufacturers and uh, there is a warranty, there are two warranty, one is called the performance warranty and there is a product warranty. The product warranty is normally kind of like 12 years and the performance warranty coming is 25 years you know the first year degradations is Li, which is lid is coming light induced degradation two and a half percent and subsequent years 0.7 percent you know so through your research you know through the, which is called the classical iec test and then it take to two times and the three times it's called a tracer test as well you know so how you are ensuring and giving a confidence like you know the product or the bomb which you choose is more than 25 years the product will you know warranty you know that kind of thing yeah, <clears throat> I think you have touched a very valid point. Uh, that's actually a very major concern <clears throat> because the products which are made for European conditions, if we simply replicate it here, it's, it's like designed to failure. So <clears throat> we have also seen that we have done this, as you said, the uh, uh, accelerated sequential testing uh, compared to an IEC. Uh, there are some primary differences. You know, an IEC does a couple of tests on parallel modules, you know, a damp heat or, you know, a thermal cycling or UV, you want three tests, take three modules and do three tests. Now, it's not that the three modules separately undergo situations in the site. The same modules go through all the three conditions. When we just did that, you know, take the same module and do all the three testing, the modules fail. So this goes on to prove that, you know, it's very, very crucial that <coughs> one, you know, your bomb has to be totally, you know, to suit your conditions. In India especially, we have tremendously, you know, torturous conditions from the model point of view. We have very high temperatures in the morning, places like Rajasthan, and most of the northern part of India. Plus, by default, the cell temperature goes up, we reach up to 70, 80 degrees, and in the night, it comes up to 30 degrees. So every day, 25 years, this module goes up and down on this. So same thing with you know the the dust you don't see it in europe you know the kind of sandstorms or wind blowing dust this is like you know it, it brushes across it's like a uh, it, it, every sand particle blowing under the this thing will take a scratch you know over a period of 4 5 years we have seen failures are happening so we are making a very conscious uh, you know attempt to tell that you know you have to consider the local conditions number one and number two don't over focus on capex look at the lo longer part of the thing so that you get your revenues on a longer period of time i think these two critical criticality are necessary okay thank thank you very much so next questions i will ask Boy, Bob, huh? okay, okay so if you can uh, throw some light particularly you know um, uh, we have sometimes installed the best scada systems you know from the generation's point of view getting informations you know uh, in the head office you know what is the 
the best way of uh, monitoring, you know, the remote uh, through the remote operations, you know. So, what kind of best practices, the data analysis, or something like from the generation point of view, uh, we, we know, you know, this particular SCADA, you know, is not generating up to this point, you know, and call to the, you know, uh, to the local ONM guy, you know, just check this one, you know, if you can throw some light on that, you know, right? SCADA system that plays a very important role in the overall performance of the plant. Going forward, right now it's doing, it's being the monitoring is being done manually. A person like us is sitting in front of the system and he's, he's just looking at the things. We have to emphasize on the Internet of Things and the artificial intelligence going forward. Until and unless we bring in technology, this would be very difficult for us to increase our IRRs and to have the, well, these are the, this would be the best practices going forward. A person, there could be human error. More the human interference, more the chances of having the human error. So we have to technologize everything going forward. Every company which, are, which is in the industry, they are putting, they are giving up their best solutions. But when it comes to monitoring, the human interference is there and to minimize the human interference, Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence. These are the only two things which can help us in increasing our IRRs and having the best of the SCADA system. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think the last questions I will ask Rahul. Huh? Right. Okay. Uh, Rahul, I mean, from the technology innovations point of view, you know, uh, how uh, you want to see that we can achieve the levelized cost of electricity, you know, through the technology, I mean, through the APC, the different kind of uh, innovations at different level, you know, apart uh, from the module or see, any other things. Yeah. Uh, if you see a solar power plant where major component around 60 to 65 percent is a module and balance 30 to 35 percent is a BOS. So there are, as we, as we seen in previous presentation, where a lot of technology is developing for uh, uh, modules and balance of balance of plants side, we have already reached from thousand volt to fifteen hundred volt, where we are optimizing the cost on the BOS part. Earlier, one, one and a half years back, people were going uh, five, 600 kilowatt inverters, one megawatt inverter. Now, the two, uh, second part of 2017, people have started uh, offering the two, two megawatt, 2.5 megawatt, and now people are offering 3.125 uh, megawatt inverters. So, <clears throat> increasing the block size, we are reducing the, uh, reducing the, uh, ba balance of uh, uh, <clears throat> site as well as we are reducing the co on uh, civil uh, civil front uh, by reducing the number of tables uh, and increasing the bl uh, block size and uh, now the, uh, by maybe next uh, technology can be a 1500 volt to 2000 volt there can, can may be a possibility where we can increase and uh, look the optimization on uh, BOS part and total overall cost of the uh, LCOE. Okay, thank you. So the last questions I will ask uh, Mr. Arun. Uh, as you know, uh, we are uh, from the learning curve now going in a bigger and bigger project, you know, which is called megawatt, ultra megawatt project, you know. So uh, there are, you know, that there is challenge in the land acquisition, so it's taking more time, you know. If the land is given uh, by the government, maybe in a solar park, you know, right? And if we uh, copy a little bit from the telecom side, you know, in the telecom side means, uh, say, for example, in your roof, uh, you have installed uh, your systems, you know, you get the data, send the information, and you get a, you know, based on the information, you know, which is coming and going, you know, the de data uses, you get the revenue generations, you know. So like that, you know, can we do something in the solar itself, you know, so land will be given by the government, right? But obviously there will be a developer, right? Now the developer will give uh, only except one thing which is called the balance of the systems. In the balance of the system, 60% of the cost of the module, you know. If we ask that in the legal contract, you know, you, the module uh, uh, nowadays, you know, through the national solar missions as well as, you know, which is coming from the SEKI is a 20 gigawatt level of uh, installations, you know. If we take into the module manufacturer, take a stake for the performance for 25 years or 30 years, you know, 
the product warranty as well as the performance warranty. You understand? I mean, 60% of your stake has gone through the module manufacturer. As a developer, you put your inverter, you put your other balancer systems. Obviously, the, the thing is that, you know, uh, the operations and the maintenance system, so a lot of headache will be gone, you know, and the power may be much, much cheaper in that gate. So, can you throw some light on that, you know, the, the future thought? So, I think your risk is, uh, you know, minimized in a sense like, you know, module manufacturers, you know, I mean, which is the 60% of the whole project's cost will take their stake in that particular, you know, the tribe, it is a tripartite agreement, you know, the government will give the land, you as a developer, you know, maybe Tata, you know, so what, do you take this kind of an idea uh, which uh, have a, you know, the minimize your risk and you get a, a good generations, you know, and uh, you don't go to a financial institutions, you know, for your performance in like, whether it's a tier one company, that module, you know, either will not, uh, you don't get a loan, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So think about it. So, yeah, so see, like uh, I think your uh, business model uh, um, really is happening in China. If you look at the Chinese government, what they have done is, they have done precisely what you have been talking about. They give the land. Uh, you see in number of solar parks which are happening, uh, there are issues also with the government to acquire the land. Whereas in China, you don't find this sort of a thing happening. So Chinese government, they have their own land and then they invite people to come and uh, do the projects. It's a plug and play, sort of. And it has been fairly successful. And here, why it should not be uh, replicated is a big question. So it is also happening in a small way. So it has to scale up now in a big way with uh, 175 gigawatt what we're talking about. This is the only way you can scale up the product, the projects. So it will happen uh, if things are in place. Let's hope for the best. It will. Yeah, uh, I mean, with the present scenario, I mean, the, the cost is low. That doesn't matter, you know, but if we mitigate the risk, risk in a sense, like the module supplier will take the, you know, uh, is not only the supply, but as well as, you know, they will take the product warranty as well as performance warranty as well, you know. So that gives a, a lot of relief on the, you know, on your project side. You know? So uh, there should be a different, uh, you know, the model we should work out, you know. I mean, uh, the different corporate like the Tata, you should uh, get a role model on this kind of a thing, you know. So with the new ideas, I will ask uh, uh, from the audience side, you know, you can ask a, uh, several questions to our uh, the panelists, the expert uh, who are sitting over here, you know. Please carry on. Recently, uh, these 1,500 volt systems which people have started going for, uh, is there is any if, uh, effect of uh, increased uh, voltage, system voltage, on the PID of the system? PID. There should be, because it's all potential induced degradation. The moment the you know, low voltage system, they never reveal such uh, this decay, uh, you can say degradation. As you increase the voltage of the system, you gain on the, of course, IR drop side, but you lose on this. Uh... So what you do actually, you reduce your, uh, the DC side cost, cable cost, you know, but any module which is coming is, is called the PID registered, not PID free, you know, I'm coming back to the, the cell level, you know, when the cell is coated by the anti-reflection coating, which is called a silicon nitride, but before that, there is another layer which is called the silicon dioxide, you know. If the silicon dioxide layer is not protective, you know, so the cell manufacturing, so when people are goes for the audit, you know, they go in the cell manufacturing, how the cell is manufactured, you know. So the PID effect, you know, how, how the PID effect is come, you know, when it is laminated, the glass, the glass is what? There is a sodium ion, you know, and this sodium plus is very much mobile, you know. What happens in the cell, on the front side, it is called a negative layer. So it attract uh, through the high voltage of the sodium atom to the cell, you know, or the performance of the module, the fill factor goes down, you know. The reason is why, if you are not doing a silicon dioxide layer, you know, if you do only a silicon nitride layer, you know, this silicon nitride layer is porous, porous in a sense, and that too also only 
few nanometer. So Amrish can throw some light, you know, on the on the, on the PID effect, you know, sir, and uh, uh, on sir, the PID uh, the registers, you know. I mean, right? Okay. I would like to actually. I have the background of this. Uh, in fact, I come from amorphous silicon plant. I know that the how glass is prevent. You know that uh, silicon dioxide layer will prevent the sodium migration into yes. the device. Yes. And all those things. But my point is, see, this, uh, you know, PID effect is mitigated for a particular voltage level so far. I will, as 1000 volt. But when you increase the voltage, you are again, what is that thing further you are tweaking? Because there is a, again, that uh, silicon dioxide not only acts as a uh, barrier for sodium ions, it also if uh, you know does the job of anti reflection also that optical matching also is the other factor so otherwise I, i'm coming back to the point uh, you know so See, otherwise it will uh, you know then optically also mismatch will be there if you keep no, on no, uh, not, thickness not See, for the research, uh, if you look into the people are then, doing that for 50 years, this research, the optical yeah. matching with the silicon dioxide, silicon nitrite, with the EVA, your glass, you know, yes. the, the three multiple layer, you know. So when it is sandwiched, you know, so optically, you know, it's called an optical waveguide, you know, uh, from the normal, it's going towards this angle, you know, so the so light is trapped inside, you know. So don't uh, think about the optics, but the PID is coming because of the other factors, you know. You have to see that particularly in the night, when there is a moisture, you know, which is coming or after the cleaning, if the cleaning is not done and there is a water on the bottom line of the, you know, of her model on the table, on the array, you know. So uh -huh. if the negative junctions on the bottom line, you know, this is very prone to the PID, even if it is a negative grounding. So therefore, it is suggested that sometimes you reverse the polarity, you know, you take the, your positive connections uh, from the bottom side and take the negative connection from the top side, you know. So that kind of thing, you know, you have to work out, you know. But it is not, module is not PID free, PID registered, the right word, you know. We, we can discuss, you know, I mean, one is one. I mean, Amresh can throw some light on that. Increase in voltage, the risk of PID increases. All right. Now, how to mitigate it? See, the standard, if I remember correctly, 62804, the PID standard, it only says uh, 96 hours. 60 degree centigrade and 85 percent relative humidity. Although people over the years have done 85-85 for 96 hours. But if you have not done anything on the cell level or even you are having no PID resistant EVAs also, then it will be difficult to pass the same module with 1500 volt but for 85-85 and 96. So, what I understood from the uh, model manufacturers, they have worked on the resistive layer of the cell. That has actually increased the PID resistance from 1000 volt to 1500. But definitely you keep on increasing the voltage in higher humidity and higher temperature, the risk of PID increases. Yes, I agree with you. From inverter side, I would like to uh, add something. Yes, and the PID, it's not like that PID will not happen. So we also thought of that and we have come up with some uh, solution to this issue that we have, uh, we have given two solutions for this. One is anti-PID kit and another is PID recovery function. So anti-PID kit in our inverter, Huawei's inverter, uh, it's an external device uh, which is installed one device for five megawatt and it will not allow PID to happen in the daytime. And this, uh, he also, Mr. Gautam sir also mentioned about the PID degradation at the night time. So we have uh, added one device inside the inverter which will help the module to recover from the PID degradation happen in the uh, daytime. So it will apply a positive, uh, the reverse voltage in the night time uh, so that whatever the degradation has happened in the daytime, it will be recovered. So this is the answer of what you are asking. And if you want to understand how the electronics works behind it, we can definitely discuss uh, one is to one, yeah. Thanks. Anyone has a question, you know, please. It was a very extensive and uh, very enlightening presentation and panel uh, on various 
components in the technology ecosystem be it modules or be it materials in the modules or inverters or so we're really privileged to have such kind of a panel which have a mix of developers and material companies technology companies so now i'd like to request uh, our uh, session chair mr gautam to present small mementos to the panelists on the dais Thank you. 